It's like the most I can move it. That's fine. And I should turn off Zoom background blur. What happens if I'm in the presumal line like this? Oh, it does show up. Uh, like, yeah, you can also we're you going can to need set that. it in like official designer mode. So there's like speaker notes on your screen, but there's not there is. But really? be careful because I accidentally just recorded something else for the first one. Okay. I don't have too many, but presenter view. Presenter view. Oh, this is where it has speaker notes and stuff. I, I think it's fine. I don't, I don't need those. Man, the eraser's disgusting. This one? Yeah. Oh, wow. Here. Really going at it. Well, I just think I'm just ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. Are you reading the uh, yeah, I just wanted to do a slightly better job. Thanks a lot of time. Because our slides were big. Yeah. I thought we should have the product just trying to replace the names of it. Oh, no, it's fine. Well, it started as their slide deck. That's fact. TZ. So, yeah. Goats. They're probably going to make their own updates, so. though. Oh, I I I don't know. Sure. I did got shit. Yeah. Come here. Party on. <laughs> Pictures are good. So. Time we got. Added like half the clues. The only part left, I think, is healthy. That's all right.
I did, yeah. Right. Let me make sure it's... Yes. I'll be... I think it is for the most part. The green and the yellow look identical. Well, you know something to do with those. Oh, do you want the mic? Uh, sure. I think you'll be fine though. I'm glad it's your okay. All right, so I think we can get about started here. I want to start today uh, before we get into like talking about uh, more advanced CNN architectures. I want to start by sort of recapping what we talked about last Tuesday. Um, I apologize, that was kind of a rough introduction. That was a uh, that was me making a couple of last minute edits that probably hurt more than they helped. So I want to just review. Um, convolutions and and the architecture of a CNN to make this more clear and put it put into perspective how it relates to um, just standard um, dense neural networks. I think it's fine for it. Um, so we talked, I think I think most people felt okay about um, the actual mechanics of doing a convolution. Um, and I just wanted to sort of clarify that when we do a convolution operation, um, we treat it like a layer, like with standard dense neural networks, uh, we treated matrix multiplication as sort of like a layer, um, where all the learned parameters were all the values in our matrix and all the values in our bias vector. Um, it's going to be a very similar story with the convolution, um, where your convolutional layer will have a bunch of filters, right? And all the values inside our filter are learned. And we also have a bias term that gets added to the output of moving each window on each location um, of our input. Uh, we refer to it as a volume simply because it sort of looks like a cube. Um, and I wanted to, to reiterate um, this idea that, again, if you have a whole bunch of different filters, so if you have one filter, you're going to get an output map for every location that we started and put our, our filter where every location that it overlapped. And if you have a whole bunch of filters, if you have a whole bunch of them, then you're going to end up stacking up all of the different outputs um, from taking each one of your different filters and running it over your input. And you get something that has a number of channels in the output. Um, and Again, you can kind of think of this as like a layer of a neural network. So after we're done doing this, um, we're still going to add our activation function, like a ReLU or or something else. Um, we're still we're still going to to very much treat it, yeah, as a layer. And because all these values in here, um, because they're all because our output, our loss is are differentiable with respect to all these different parameters. We can still take partial derivatives of our loss with respect to our parameters and do gradient descent. Um, 
So it's it's simply as opposed to doing matrix multiplication on a vector, um, when you have images and a CNN, you can simply just do convolutions instead of your normal matrix multiplication, um, which is demonstrated up here. Um, you do convolutions followed by your activation functions. Um, you have pooling layers if you want to decrease the size of this volume because it can get quite unwieldy. Um, if you want to decrease the size of it so it's much quicker uh, to take this convolution, uh, you can do pooling simply just looking at each. If you have a, a two by two pooling, you're just going to look at every channel, look at a little two by two square, take the maximum, look at the next two by two square over, and the next two by two square over to simply just chop your the size of your output uh, in half. Um, and were there were there questions on on this on the sort of mechanics of like what a CNN is and what it what it looks like mechanically? Um, yes, friend. Yeah, it's, it's a question. Um, yeah. Every filter yeah. 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 Every filter has, has its own bias. So basically, every blue that is created has like. Every element in that layer is being added. Yeah, you can yeah, you can think of it like that. I, I normally think of it as like after we're done doing all the element-wise multiplies um, from overlapping our filter with our input, uh, we then just add the bias corresponding to that filter onto it. But yeah, that's like in, that's probably an equally as intuitive way to do it. Um, is just add the corresponding bias to the corresponding channel, the corresponding channel in the output. Yeah, um, but again, the big the big thing I really want to get across is that you treat it just like another layer. Um, you're just going to stack a bunch of them. Um, and then eventually, when you want to get to the end, you take this volume and you just unravel it in a very specific, you just flatten it all out um, and then just do like a dense layer, a regular matrix multiplication um, at the end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so obviously, you had like yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if I was an item to do a pulse, I got a minus again. It's like pooling, like is it pooling like a pooling layer? Is that like a common parity? No, not really. Um it's just there because like if we if we have like a huge input that's like 256 by 256, our images are like huge. Uh the output Assuming you don't do a strided convolution, which is just taking your filter overlapping, in this case, a three by three area. And instead of moving over one to overlap in the next area, you move it over two. Um, if you don't want to do a strided convolution, a very simple way to do it is to just look at individual little squares and just take the max in this whole area, each one of these areas, and just spit that out. Um, that just immediately cuts the whole thing in half on uh, your height and width axis. So you have a quarter as many values now, um, but it still ideally still sort of captures all the main information that was in that uh, that feature volume. Um, yeah, it's, it's more just used so we can get our feature volume down to a reasonable size so it doesn't take forever to run convolutions on it. Just makes it a lot quicker. So what are you doing? Yeah, no. Well, so we're going to talk about um, segmentation, which is where you have like an image with like a person in it. And you need to output another image, except each pixel has basically been like labeled with like, there's a person in all of these pixels inside of like here. And then everything else is background. So in that case, your output is the same size as your input which gets a little bit weird. And we'll talk about that more later. How you, because at face value, that would be like super inefficient. All of your convolutions are on these just huge inputs. We'll talk about that more later, but generally for things like classification, you do want to start bringing it down a little bit. Um, there's no reason to, to leave our feature volume huge um, if we can shrink the size of it without reducing the amount of information in it, hopefully. Does that make a little bit of sense? Are there more questions? Because last lecture was confusing, and I, I apologize. That was a pretty rough introduction to CNNs. Um, yeah. Yes, friend. I understand like the height and the width. Uh, yeah. Like, like, I'm, I'm the depth. Uh, yeah. 
So for your input image, the depth is like RGB, uh, like one, one channel is what we call it for each pixel. But say we had like 10 filters, uh, it no longer corresponds to like color, the output of a convolution layer with 10 filters. Uh, it simply means there were 10 different activation maps, one from each filter that we obtained. So your, your channel's dimension uh, would be 10 deep. Um, yeah, it just corresponds to like, if, if this filter is corresponds to like horizontal edges, and this filter corresponds to like edges like this, um, you can just sort of look along the channel and see like, okay, like was there an edge that went this way? Was there an edge that went this way? You can just sort of look in all of the, the different features throughout that channel. Um, they just correspond to what the filter, what that filter in the previous layer picked up on. Does that kind of make sense? There's not like a, an intuitive, like sort of like color um, as, as you, after the first layer. Um, but, but yeah, excellent question. Um, are there more questions? Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, then I will hand it over to Rohan, who's going to talk about um, more advanced CNN architectures. And I just want to contextualize this. Um, with There's only really like one architecture that you really need to take away from here, which is going to be ResNet. We'll get to that. Um, the rest of them, like if it goes over your head, like don't worry, it's it's fine. This is just more for people who who want to know. Um, ResNets are the only one we should really like feel free to ask like tons of questions because we want to spend the most time on that and all that. Um, so yeah, go on. Hello. Um, so this is going to be kind of a survey on the uh, the history of uh, neural network architectures for computer vision. Um, starting from, uh, there's a little timeline here. Starting from uh, AlexNet and moving forward, um, LayNet is something that was created quite a while ago. Um, and AlexNet is like the first kind of visible improvement in this field um, that kind of starts the motivations behind creating a deep network that can be learned from without any gradient problems and things like that. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking about AlexNet, BGG, um, the motivation behind Inception Nets, um, as well as briefly about mobile nets um, and landing with, with ResNets and a couple other um, miscellaneous networks. Um, none of these are state of the art on the ImageNet now, I believe. Um, things have kind of transitioned uh, to transformers and other much more advanced architectures that we're going to be talking about in the next couple of weeks. Um, but this is understanding the motivation behind these um, really sets the stage for uh, the, the future of advancement in this field. So yeah, convolutional nets, uh, like Jake was describing, a single convolutional layer. These were proposed in 1990 by Yen LeCun, um, and he, he kind of pioneered that pattern for today. He's currently head of AI at Facebook uh, AI Research, um, so furthering the metaverse. Um, for those of you that are into that kind of thing. Um, but AlexNet in uh, 2012 was a, a big groundbreaking feat in that it proposed stacking layers of convolutions, max poolings, following it up by fully connected layers and coming up with not a very deep network, but one of the deeper networks um, that were introduced at the time. Um, this kind of uh, turned a lot of heads when it achieved a around 17% error rate on ImageNet. Um, there are conferences yearly that will evaluate uh, state-of-the-art models and papers against ImageNet, um, and it won in 2012. Um, in fact, most of these architectures won in their respective year. Um, BGG in 2014, I think, InceptionNet in 2015, a um, lot of really cool advancements. Um, So going on over the architecture of AlexNet, um, there's a lot of things to consider, and this makes it look extremely complicated. Um, in reality, all this is doing is stacking convolutional layers and pooling layers intelligently to synthesize information from low-level features and work its way up as it passes through the network to higher features, which really is the motivation behind most of these architectures. Start off with a bunch of data, a full dimension image, with all the features that you have in whatever your input is, um, start to detect low level trends, create feature maps, pass it through pooling layers to condense the information that you have. And lastly, 
come up with a prediction or a model that can be used to predict because now you have a feature map that corresponds to different classification metrics. So there are some observations. There's only five convolutional layers um, and the next slide should have an updated drawing that's hopefully a lot easier to understand than the previous one. Um, but this has a convolutional layer followed by a max pooling layer, another convolutional layer followed by max pooling, then three convolutional layers stacked followed by a max pooling layer and it ends with a couple of fully connected um, layers. Um, so three hefty dense layers are following this last stack of convolutions and max pooling. And that results in a lot of parameters. Um, dense layers are, are fully connected. So you're doing your matrix multiplication across the entire layer. So your number of parameters stacks up quite a bit. This also means that the number of computations that you need to do stacks up quite a bit. But we want to go deeper, right? Um, only having five convolutional layers and three dense layers really limits the amount of information we can synthesize by our feature maps. Um, you might have heard the term deep neural networks. Um, this course, I believe, is called deep learning for computer vision. So that is something that we're going to touch on. Um, but this, this can barely be considered um, a deep neural network just because of how shallow it is. We want to abstract these concepts more. We want to be able to have our model learn higher order feature maps. And by that, I mean um, low level features um, like edges, things like that. But as we go higher, um, starting to see the correlation between like color spaces, um, how edges lead to other forms um, and things like that. Yeah, this is basically that what like what I was talking about. Um, there's a lot of space that we want to have and we want to uh, go through this architecture. Um, so yeah, this, this is hopefully a lot easier to understand than the previous drawing, and it's saying the same thing. So you have um, a, this is a five by five image with three channels, um, similar to what Jake is drawing here, actually. Um, this is your original image in like RGB or something. It's passed in through to a convolutional layer. It's max pooled, so its dimension has been reduced, um, either through like some average pooling um, or some gradient like that. Um, passed through a, another convolution, that's max pooled again, dimension is further reduced. And then you pass through three convolutions, which don't change dimension. You max pool at the end of that. And then you go into the concept that Jake was talking about earlier, which is flattening. So by unraveling the final kind of layer that you have, you're end, you end up with a one dimensional vector instead of whatever you landed up with after your convolutions. These are then passed through three dense layers. This is what, um, we were talking about earlier, um, and lastly, pass into a soft, soft max function. So up until this point, all of the activation functions are uh, ReLU, so rectified linear. Um, that's at the end of each convolutional layer and max pooling layer. Soft max at the end will scale on a zero to one scale, so it'll give you like your final like predictive class that you would want to have. Um, this is how the sizes are changed as uh, a image would go through AlexNet. Um, so this is say you start off with a, a 227 by 227 by three image, um, you have a stride of four. So this is like approximately quartered. Um, your kernel size, and we talked about that, is like the, the size of the kernel that you're sliding across um, the image. Uh, that's 11 by 11. You pool with a stride of two. So you're having a dimension, um, the actual image dimension. You go through another convolution, um, which adds depth to the image uh, given your, your kernel size. Um, and once again, you pool, you're having the dimension of the actual. So basically each of these steps corresponds to each of these steps, uh, as you can see here. Um, you end with three fully connected layers and you go into a soft max function, which ultimately instead of ReLU, so scaling uh, linearly, soft max will scale more logarithmically um, and it'll give you a final like probability map. Um, are there any questions on AlexNet actually before uh, we move on? Yeah, so. Yeah, so uh, if you don't specify a certain type of padding, valid padding is going to be applied to make sure that as you're sliding your uh, kernel across an image, 
uh, you're left with the same dimension. Uh, is there anything you want to add, Jake? Or? No, that's I I should have mentioned adding to. Yeah, I mean you did a good job. We basically just add a bunch of zeros on the outside. Um, if we wanted to fool with the uh, the size of our output of a certain layer. Yeah. And by having a stride of one, um, you don't like lose information. You don't reduce size. You're li quite literally going over every single pixel in your image. Um, yeah, and as you can see, uh, we use uh, ReLU activation all the way until the end. Uh, VGG is, you can think of it as a deeper AlexNet. Um, there's not too much to go over here. Um, the motivation behind this is you want a deeper neural network. Um, that's kind of the purpose of this. Now, instead of five convolutional layers, you have 23. You still have the three dense layers at the end, which computes a little bit better um, because computers evolve. Um, CPU power is able to handle these high order matrix computations. Um, but yeah, you have a lot of parameters um, as is kind of a side effect of all these computations that you're trying to do. Uh, so this is an interesting observation, using a one-by-one -one convolution to create a transformation of input channels. Um, so one-by-one -one convolutions can actually be used as a form of padding and dimensionality addition and reduction. Um, we're going to be talking about that a little bit more, um, as you can see in, like, I think one or two slides. Uh, but we do want a higher accuracy. We want a deeper network. We want something that is able to effectively both space and time effectively compute these matrix products. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. and you're also adding pixels to uh, the the top and bottom as you're sliding, if that makes sense. There is a, yeah, there's a picture on the next slide, I believe. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. So a one-by-one one convolution, uh, the, the motivation behind it is you're applying a linear function that doesn't lose information as you go across. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why the size won't change. The important thing is the channels change, though. Oh, like the number of filters that you have, and I can't have a brand new. But yeah, you won't change the actual size of the image dimension, oh, yeah. the depth of your, or like, uh, yeah, depth is kind of how I think about it, but in reality, it's channels that are gradiently moving. Yeah. That was a good question, though. Yeah, so this is an example with BGG 16. So this is 16 layers. Um, with three dense layers at the end as well. Um, as you can see, as you go through your convolutions, your output dimension is shrinking. So based on your kernel size, your actual image is shrinking, but your number of channels increases as you gain information. Um, as you can see in VGG16 specifically, it looks like the size is approximately getting halved every time. Um, and yeah. Uh, this is more so just a visualization of how you have multiple layers that are stacked. They're pooled together, which is where you're having the information that you have between each of these steps. Um, as you apply your kernel of size two by two, you're increasing the number of channels and information that you're getting. Um, and lastly, you're passing it into three dense layers to do those matrix, matrix multiplications at the end post flattening. All right, so um, inception nets. Uh, this drawing is also quite complicated, um, but what you need to take away from this is that um, you, sorry, is that um, you want to be able to use one by one convolutions to keep your input size the same as you go through multiple steps, as well as do your regular max pooling and convolutional uh, step with a uh, certain kernel. Um, this is going to be explained more clearly. There's a visualization for this as well. Um, but essentially, you're taking information from the previous layer um, and also using it in 
the current layer that you're using. And this is kind of kind of lead into the next topic that we're going to talk about. So yeah, there's a lot of one by one convolutions. Um, these are used to only change the number of channels and not modify the input size. Uh, these are deep and wide to capture features at different scales. Um, and that is also going to be covered in terms of depth wise uh, convolutions as well as point wise convolutions. These are combined to form a more efficient computationally uh, method uh, while still retaining all the information that we get with a traditional uh, convolution neural network. Uh, yeah, this is uh, not explained super well, um, but essentially um, we want to encourage discrimination in lower stages, um, increase the gradient signal that gets propagated back and provide additional regularization. Um, the motivation behind this is that, again, we want to learn low level features um, in earlier stages of the classifier and then as we go through, we want to consider previous layers and previous inputs that we've taken into account um, to regularize and make sure that spatial, uh, I guess, discrimination is maintained in our gradients. So as we're tuning, as we're going through the, the back propagation process, there are a couple of common issues that can uh, kind of result from just blindly stacking layers. Um, so you might have asked, uh, we saw AlexNet, and we saw BGG, which was like basically the same thing, but we added a couple more layers. Why can't we just infinitely stack these layers? Um, and there are a lot of problems that come with that, that Inception and ResNets um, try to fix. And that is adding residuals, yeah? Uh, so we got to talk about ResNets, but are these branched off like earlier and earlier in the What do you mean by branched off? Like where do you so talk about it? So like yeah, the, the classifier is at the end. Uh, by this, uh, again, there's there's a drawing for it, but uh, essentially you have a, yeah, yeah, you have a multi-headed, yeah. So you're you're taking whatever your uh, input is in a certain step and applying it to the output of another step. Um, this maintains kind of a, a back, it's a backwards way of maintaining a residual value, uh, which is why it's called uh, residuals. Um, we want higher accuracy and a simpler architecture. And these are two things that Inception Nets um, are able to give us in some form, um, but ResNets bring to another level as well. Um, so yeah, this is the intuition that I was talking about before. Adding more layers shouldn't hurt uh, because the layer can learn the identity transform, which is essentially how you're transforming a certain input in every step. So the accuracy should not decrease as you add a bunch of layers. However, this is not the case. Adding more and more layers hurts because you're not taking into account the uh, previous identities that you've had post-transformation. Um, this is kind of where residuals come into play and you'll see that soon. Um, vanishing gradients is a common problem as you add a bunch of layers stacked together and that the learning signal or the gradient computation becomes extremely weak. The model struggles to learn um, and your weights start vanishing. Um, the other side of this problem is exploding gradients, um, which isn't as applicable to this, uh, but another problem, a third problem is uh, shattering gradients. And uh, the, the point of shattering gradients is that as I go deeper into an extremely deep convolutional neural network, um, my gradients actually start resembling white noise. So there's no uh, pattern. My model isn't actually learning anything uh, because of the depth of the network. This chain rule that never updates based on a previous step, um, it only goes backwards in time. It never learns the identity transform. This is where residuals come into play. That's why it's called ResNet. The solution is make it easier to learn at least the identity. So keep information from previous stages into future computation. That's like the, the key motivation behind residuals. So yeah, this is what I was talking about earlier, um, which is that you have X, which is some identity that you want to keep in mind. Um, you have F of X, which is the function that you're applying through your weight layer and ReLU activation function. Um, as your X goes through a weight layer, the function is applied. You go through another weight layer. This F of X kind of encompasses that process. This is the function that you've applied to X. Now your output is whatever F of X is. 
the motivation behind residuals is that after your f of x has been applied, you add x back into your network. Um, so by multiplying or by adding the resultant x by whatever your original identity was and using that as the input for the next layer, you've maintained a semblance of what you had prior to whatever function you've applied. So this helps, especially when you're adding, you're doing this computation like hundreds of times as your layers and your the depth of your network increases. Yeah, so as you can see, each one of these jumps is a residual um, that's being computed. Um, so a 34 layer residual um, will have jumps uh, in this case, shown between every two. Um, but there is another topic um, that we wanted to talk about, um, which is bottlenecking. So as you tune uh, how, how often your residual is considered. So for example, if this jump was after three or four layers, um, this is a process known as bottlenecking versus if it was after every layer. Um, the idea behind this is that um, adding residuals will increase the time to convergence because you're increasing the number of backwards considering computations that you have. So if your if your bottleneck isn't as big, your time to convergence will be smaller. So as your uh as your residual skips more and more levels, your time to convergence will be smaller, but your results may also not be as good uh, because you're not negating the problem. Um, this is highly dependent on what system you're using to compute these, um, as well as like where the model is eventually running. So yeah, um, yeah, there. That was an example of a very long uh, residual net. Adding skip connections makes the identity easier to learn because you're quite literally adding a previous identity to the resultant of a transformation. Uh, as you can see, this is a gradient map, uh, the lost surface of ResNet with and without skip connections. Uh, oops. Yeah, as you can see, um, this is used to, uh, this makes the <laughs> loss a lot smoother um, because your identity is preserved as opposed to trying to retrain after every transformation. Yeah. yeah. I am not sure, actually. Yeah, it's some weird shit. Yeah. Because, like, the loss you get after every update step is, like, a number. So, yeah, I'm not... The loss is, like, super high dimensional. It's just some kind of, like, a... Low dimensional uh, projection. Loss. Yeah. People have, like, weapons on this stuff, too. Yeah. Like, this is, like, probably, like, the one really important thing for today and like this idea of like why it'd be important to sort of be able to learn the identity like it's sort of a weird thing um are there other questions or comments or concerns about that yeah, yeah. i think it's worth like just learning the identity once yeah or something like yeah for sure right so like if you have a dense neural network like like let's just ignore convolutions for right now if you have like a dense neural network, trivially, you have a matrix called the identity matrix, which is just ones along the diagonal. And it spits out the exact same thing that it took in. So if I have like a vector and I multiply it by like the identity matrix and like x1, x2, whatever, uh, I'm going to get that exact same vector here, x, that I took in. So like if I have a neural network and I just trivially add, so I have like a whole bunch of like layers, right? Like this, this layer connects up to the next layer, right? Like just a, a dense neural network. And I just make each layer like the identity matrix. If I make all the weights correspond to the identity matrix, like there's no reason I shouldn't be able to make like a million length neural network, which is kind of absurd. But like in practice, we've observed that like if you add, if you put a million layers on a dense neural network, it's going to just learn like garbage. Like it's not going to work at all. 
But like, that's kind of weird because we should just trivially be able to add more layers if you carefully select the weights so that it spits out exactly what it took in. It's just kind of curious that it was observed that deeper networks don't work. And this makes it super easy. So if your weights are literally all zeros and your biases are literally all zeros, you're going to spit out exactly what you took in. So it makes it really, really easy for the network to just say like, hey, okay, we've got enough information at this point in the network. Like we don't need to learn more complicated features. I could just send the weights to zero and just ship exactly what I have about halfway through the network all the way to the end. Does that kind of make sense? Like it's way easier to learn to just uh, to change what you have. Um, or it's it's much easier to just spit out exactly your features like halfway through the network if your network decides like okay like we've got enough information to like make a good classification but we're only about like halfway through the network with with this it's just super easy for it to learn like okay we don't we don't need the rest of these layers they're they're only going to just confuse the signal uh, how do you know exactly like how many is uh, to do before adding a into that Oh, like how many layers to have in your block here? Yeah. So, I mean, ResNet just used two. Uh, two is a fine choice. It's it's just something you can tune. Yeah. Um, yeah, you mentioned that like, the issue with the stacking layers, like how is that like potentially an issue or like the signal that they know? Is that it's not just because like I guess I'm asking like is that really unique? Why does that like there's like you get hurt? But it's not just because that you're reading so well that's gonna be supposed to be one of your bosses, right? Kill takes one or you can you can take it. Okay. So like if you're doing the chain rule, it just results in a lot of multiplications. Right, like the more like um like we talked in the third lecture about applying like the chain rule um to deep neural networks, and if you know um every little individual step in your network, if you just multiply the partial derivatives of all of those steps, you can find the the derivative of your loss with respect to a given parameter, um, just with the chain rule. But if all of these different things that you're multiplying are even a little bit smaller than one, immediately like. At a certain point, at a certain number of multiplications, your partial derivative, uh, your your chain rule that you've gotten as a result of many, many multiplications just gets sent straight to zero. Um, and on the other hand, if your uh, values, if all of your individual little partial derivatives of all the individual little steps are a little bit bigger than one, it's going to explode. Um, and that's just not helpful. Um, it's problematic. Uh, we would like, yeah, we would like to update our weights in a way that is like sort of uh, sort of regular, a little bit more consistent um, so that our weights aren't either just exploding because the gradient steps are huge or they're just literally never going to change. So does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. so if it's really small, it's not really ready to be full. It's just one of those things. If I go to this whole spot, it's going to be time to jump with the weights. Yeah, if you're stacking like a bunch of sub one multiplications, you're going to be left like a super sum, small number as you go back. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily mean you're close to a minimum either. Like, because your loss surface can be like a little plateau. It just means that for some of our, our parameters really early in our network where the gradients that we're getting are either huge or super small, it just means it's not moving. It's not moving isn't necessarily the same thing as being at a minimum. And there's other things that help with vanishing gradients like batch norm helps as well. Um, and it's probably like a bigger contributor to like stopping the vanishing gradient problem than uh, Residual. than residuals, but like residuals help. I think residuals are more for like shattered gradients. So that's when like you introduce a bunch of like meaningless noise into your gradients. So there's slightly different problems where your gradients start resembling noise instead of something that's actually meaningful as you go through backprop. No, it comes from again like the the depth of the matrix multiplication that you're doing. Uh, so without like by losing form of the identity, uh, that is the reason that stacking a bunch of layers doesn't result in like better performance or strictly better performance, even like equivalent performance. Actually, uh, you would think that like 
going from like three to 20 layers. Uh, this is like a very small example, but like that shouldn't reduce accuracy when in reality, like if this is scaled, it can. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a really good point. Um, so if your layer is a convolution, um, the dimension can change, which is why often this is result like kind of viewed as f of x plus w of x, where w is a transformation that you do on x to to make it the same dimension. Exactly. Yeah, to make sure that your matrix addition stays the same. You're, you're talking about which weights are you saying? Oh, so or... that means that, like, by adding the identity, right, they can zero out the weights of the last two layers such that those were unnecessary. Like, is this it's, it's more so that you maintain information that you had previously post a feature map being applied. So you're not necessarily zeroing out uh, learned weights. Uh, this, like, like Jake was saying, like other ways of uh, normalizing your data as you go through like batch norm affect the vanishing gradient problem more than residuals do. The main point of this is that you want to maintain a semblance of identity as you go through your uh, your network, if that makes sense. But that was a very good catch on the dimensions of X. Yeah, this is often viewed as plus W of X. Are there any other questions about ResNet? All right, dope. Uh, so the next thing to talk about is global average pooling, um, which is designed to replace fully connected layers in CNNs. Um, this is also used in ResNet in replacement of the fully connected layers. Um, you're generating a feature map for each category of the classification task. So once you have a the vector that you want to classify, your classification vector, um, you're generating a feature map for each of those, averaging those, and then that is fed into the softmax layer. Um, this, uh, the typical dense layer that you previously had that's facilitating these connections um, does not enforce correspondences between feature maps and categories. You're kind of throwing feature maps down the drain as you go through the three dense layers at the end of a network. There's no parameter to optimize in global average as well, which saves overfitting time. Um, because you're just generating a feature map, averaging those and feeding that into a softmax function, you're not actually tuning a parameter to your data. And in dense layers, this often results in, if I have a very deep neural network uh, that is trained on a certain subset of data, if I have a bunch of dense layers at the end, it's very easy to overfit to the data that I have provided uh, for training. Um, so this kind of prevents that. Um, and this comes more into play also in mobile nets and uh, efficient nets that will be talked about as well. All right, um, are there any questions on the previous kind of topics? All right, that, that was kind of the meat of this lecture. Uh, but mobile nets are very cool in that you're, you're using depth-wise convolutions and point-wise convolutions to reduce the number of computations that you're, you're doing. Um, yeah, so as we get deeper, the number of channels can get large, which leads to a lot of parameters. What if we process each channel separately and then intelligently combine those at the end? How can we still retain data from each channel while reducing the number of uh, computations that we need to do? The answer is depth-wise separable convolutions. So this is a, a pretty decent visualization of how that works. If you have like a three channel, uh, like some X by X image, you're applying a uh, like a, a feature map to it. 
um, that results in one product, and then you're left with one product by one channel. Um, instead of that, what if we took each channel individually, we applied a smaller or a, a lower dimension feature map uh, to it, created three depth-wise layers, um, and then combined those with a, uh, in this case, it would be a three, three, a one by one by three convolution. So once I have these three layers, I can get the same output size here by applying a one by one by three uh, feature to it if that makes sense. Um, hopefully this will explain it a little bit more. So if I have an eight by eight by three uh, kind of channeled image after a convolution step, we want to increase or decrease channels. In this case, we want to decrease it so that we're left with the same output size as we would have if we did this three by three by three map. So by taking one by one by three image uh, kind of, calculations, we're left with the same eight by eight by one image um, that we, we wanted to get. Um, yeah, this is extremely important when we want to stack a bunch of uh, filters or a bunch of layers. So when this computation is being scaled over a, a wide variety of filters that we're running, um, in this case, it's 256, but um, we want to be able to do these computations more efficiently. Uh, and there's a little example that will hopefully show uh, how the math behind this works. Um, so essentially, yeah, if, if, if you had a 12 by 12 by three image and a like a five by five by five by three, feature, you would have to do, and this would result in eight by eight by one at the end of your process, um, you would have to do 75 computations as this is applied into like a smaller subset over here. And this is three channels um, times, this would be 64 times, right? So this would be times your 64. Um, and then this would then be multiplied uh, uh, 256 times or however many channels that you're doing. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we did the other metric, which is instead of a five by five by three, we have a uh, five by five by one, uh, then we still have uh, 25, which is the amount of computation we're doing on a single pane times uh, 64 times, again, your three channels. Um, sorry, 25 times 64, uh, which gets you your same eight by eight by one as you're stacking. This is then multiplied by 256. So now you have 64 times three when your one by one by one convolution is applied to uh, the kind of single, singly eight by eight by one image that you have, if that makes sense. Um, there's some visualizations on the next slide that make a lot more sense. Yeah. So you're applying this one dimensional filter to each channel of your image that is applied to, to each one. These are then concatenated together and you apply a smaller point wise convolution one by one by the number of channels you have to end up with a feature uh, or a, a resultant that's the same dimension as you would be expecting, which highly reduces the number of computations that you need to do. So yeah, normal, you would do three by three by three by eight, which is, you know, you have a, a three by three by three block, you're multiplying that by eight or whatever the size of your, your output is, um, versus now you have a three by three by three, the same computation that you're doing, but now you're doing a one by one by three times eight which is like the size of your, uh, I guess, output uh, channel. So if I had a, starting off at the, the last step, right? If you have an eight by eight by three image that you're, you're running this on, now, instead of going through and like, I guess, multiplying this by 256, which is like how it would generally work, I'm, I'm running a, then one by one by three layer here. So this is 64 times three, it's 192. And this is what is being multiplied by the 256 and added to our previous product, 
which is 74 times 64. So these two are being added together to end up with your, your final computation for how many, I guess, multiplication parameters you have. Other questions about this? <laughs> Yeah, so this is the same kind of chart that we had before, but applied to the mobile net. Um, and thinking about it in terms of like simpler problems, simpler uh, layers kind of helps you visualize it better. Yeah, uh, I'm just trying to do, okay. Yeah, so mobile net has a lot fewer parameters, which results in a lot faster convergence time, um, and it matches inception MV3 accuracy just by using depth and pointwise convolutions and combining those. So you can think about it, instead of doing one step that results in one map and multiplying that by the number of filters you have, you're now doing one step which generates a, a feature map of the same number of channels. So you're applying this one step to every channel. And then your next step is applying a different sized convolution to do your, your filter multiplication. So instead of one, yeah, so instead of one step, you have two steps that are being combined, um, which reduces complexity quite a bit. Alrighty, I guess we can quickly go over like squeeze and excite networks. Basically, uh, you squeeze, you apply this through a couple of dense layers, and then you rescale. So we talked about global average pooling, um, how you come up with a feature map for each channel. You're compressing this through a fully connected layer, passing it through ReLU. And with a fully connected layer, you can also expand this back to whatever dimension you originally had. Um, rescaling, according to the layer output, is also not as computationally intensive. OK. Wait. So the rest of these, I think the slides are pretty good and, and compressed in a very visual way. Uh, the remainder of the uh, more impressive architectures of the blade. But I, I hope the main takeaways are that you'll like understand those tools and that you you see that we've like added all of these different sort of like tools to your tool belt now. So like residual connections, you can just use them in place of regular convolutions, stepwise stepable convolutions. Um, and one by one convolutions, you can just throw them uh, instead of using a, a standard convolution. Like they're just different little tools that you can you can swap out if you're doing all the CNN building blocks. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think understanding like the the base of how optimizations are held and the problems that certain optimizations face and others don't really sets the stage for like future networks. Like the efficient net in 2020, um, we can straight up just go by what we've already learned in that we know we can pass through a one by one convolution, a depth wise convolution, which is where we apply this filter to each channel individually, um, recombine them using our squeeze and excite networks, and then pass it through another one by one convolution to maintain like dimensionality. Um, so really uh, that's all these architectures are, is just taking a bunch of building blocks and putting them together. Yeah, this is kind of a graph comparing efficient net in latency and accuracy to other networks. Yeah, so these are some things that these models wanted to optimize over time, accuracy, performance, and model size. Um, Model size is something that has a trade-off. If you get too big, you lose out on other metrics like accuracy. Um, performance is something that directly corresponds to depth-wise convolutions and mobile nets um, for edge computing and things like that. You want to drastically reduce the number of computations that you want to do. Yep, that is basically everything for today. Thank you guys for coming. Oh, and there will also be a quiz. <laughs> there will also be a quiz at least tonight. Is there homework for this week also or not? Uh, we're trying to get this Friday. And do next Friday? Uh, Friday. Uh, no, like, we need a little bit of work.
Thank you. For sure.